Welcome again to another study in God's Holy Word. Our subject today is the church and the dragon. It's found in Revelation chapter 12. Our subject is Revelation chapter 12, the church and the dragon. This is a very, very important subject, one that helps us to understand how God's church will be victorious. Have you ever wondered how God's church will at last overcome the world and the enemy of souls? How will she, in spite of troubles within and troubles without, become, as the great Apostle Paul put it, a church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing? While this question is particularly important when we consider that more and more Seventh-day Adventist Christians are coming to the sad realization that the corporate body of believers have lost sight of Jesus our Lord and of his holy standards. The following quotation is one of many scathing testimonies uttered by the servant of the Lord that reveals the seriousness of the condition we as a people find ourselves. The statement is taken from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 217, 217 of Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5. Now listen to what inspiration has to say here about this uh, this this condition that we find ourselves in. The church has turned back from following Christ her leader and is steadily retreating towards Egypt. Yet few are alarmed or astonished at their want of spiritual power. Doubt and even disbelief of the testimonies of the Spirit of God is leavening our churches everywhere. In Volume 8, Testimonies for the Church, page 249 through pages 251, Listen to what inspiration has to say. Another startling statement about our condition. What stronger delusion can beguile the mind than a pretense that you are building on the right foundation and that God accepts your works when in reality you are working out many things according to worldly policy and are sinning against Jehovah? Oh, it is a great deception, a fascinating delusion, that men who have once known the truth mistake the form of godliness for the spirit and power thereof, when they suppose that they are rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing, while in reality they are in need of everything. Unless the church which is now being leavened with her own backsliding shall repent and be converted, she will eat of the fruit of her own doing until she shall abhor herself. The foregoing citations not only state the problem, but show us the root or cause of our spiritual malady. It is our disregard of the testimonies that has caused our spiritual decline. Instead, rather than going up, instead, we are working out many things according to worldly policy. So what is the solution? How will the church become the mighty force for good if she is now in this lamentable predicament? How will she be fit to save a dying world? How will she become fair as the moon, clear as the sun, as terrible as an army with banners, going forth into all the world, conquering and to conquer? That statement, by the way, is taken from Prophets and Kings, pages 725. And in fact, if you can read onward, and you will see there that we're told that the church is going to be victorious. Prophets and Kings, page 725. Now, brothers and sisters, this is saying to us clearly that God intends to have a mighty, powerful church, a church filled with his spirit, going forth fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and as terrible as an army with banners to proclaim the gospel in all the world. Perhaps you are thinking that the answer is the shaking, or maybe the mark of the beast. Yes, it is true that there will be a shaking. In fact, the shaking is taking place right now, according to early writings, pages 270 and 271. Oh, yes, brothers and sisters, the straight testimony is being proclaimed, but there are those who are rising up against it. And this is what inspiration says will cause, or is causing, a shaking among God's people. So the answer to our dilemma is not the shaking. Yes, there will be a shaking. But that is not the solution to the problems that we face as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. It is also true that the mark of the beast decree, the Sunday laws, 
or the enforcement of a false system of worship will soon take place. However, this is not the answer. Yes, God's people must be sealed prior to the enforcement of the image of the beast. In Revelation chapter 7, it tells us that the 144,000 were sealed before the winds would blow. According to volume 5, Testimonies for the Church, page 152, we're told there by inspiration that the winds represent the mark of the beast decree, and that the 144,000 must be sealed prior to the blowing of the winds, that is, prior to, prior to, before the mark of the beast decree, before the Sunday laws. So again, this is not the solution. This is not going to prepare God's SDA church today for what is soon to come upon the world. There are those who are still yet in Babylon who will have to face this Sunday law. But the 144,000, God's church today, his SDA church, will be sealed prior to this time. Now, this will be made plainer as we progress, and if you want more details or information on this particular aspect of our subject, you can order our tape on Revelation chapter 7, the 144,000, who are they? And there you will find detailed explanation with the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy references concerning this subject. So to find our answers, we need to go to the book of Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 will give us the answer to the question as to how the church will be prepared to meet the time of the mark of the beast, the enforcement of the Sunday laws, and how the church will be able to go forth in all the world proclaiming the gospel, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and as terrible as an army with the banners. So let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, beginning with verse 1, we will read up to verse 6. We would. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she have a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. What we have just read here is a woman clothed with the sun, having the moon under her feet. She is crowned with twelve stars, and then she has a great red dragon before her, the dragon having seven heads and ten horns and crowns upon those heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. The woman now was pregnant. She was about to deliver her child. She was travailing in birth. She had reached the time of her deliverance. And Satan, knowing who the child was, he waited. He waited to destroy the child as soon as he was born. Of course, we know that this child is Jesus, our Lord. The Bible says he was caught up to God and to his throne. So to understand this prophecy, we need to first look at the meaning of the woman. What does a woman represent in the Bible? Well, to find our answer, we need to go to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 6. Let us begin by looking at verse 2. It says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. And thus Jeremiah 6, 2 says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. You could also look at Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 4, where a similar thought is brought to light. A woman in the Bible is oftentimes used as a symbol of God's church. As most every Bible student agrees, a woman is a symbol of God's people, his church particularly. In the book Great Controversy, page 381, Ellen White points out that a vile woman can also represent a church, but not God's church. A vile woman would represent an apostate church. In Revelation chapter 17, 
Babylon is represented as a woman, a figure which is used in the Bible as the symbol of a church, a virtuous woman representing a pure church, a vile woman, an apostate church. That was Great Controversy, page 381. So then we see that a woman in the Bible is a symbol of the church. In this case, this woman is pure, so it would represent God's church, God's people. Note that she's clothed with the sun and has the moon under her feet. So she represents God's true people, his true bride. But what church would she represent? What church would this woman represent? Well, she would have to be the Jewish church and not the Christian. Why? Well, obviously this child, the child that she gave birth to, is Jesus, our Lord, who after conquering sin on this earth ascended to God's throne on high, and we praise God for that. So the woman brought forth Jesus. What church brought forth Christ? Was it not the Jewish church? So at the time that John first sees the woman, she represents the Jewish church, the church that looked for Christ and expected his first coming. It must be pointed out that this woman cannot be the Christian church, at least not at the time that John first sees her. Why? Well, note that the woman was already pregnant with Christ when John first describes the woman. If she is the one who brought forth the Christian church, it, rather if Jesus is the one that brought forth the Christian church, and we know that he was the founder of the Christian church, then how could she be his mother? And was not Christ born at least 30 years prior or before the Christian church came into being? Well, to use the old cliché, you can't have the cart before the horse. So then the woman did exist way back in the time of the Jewish dispensation. And later on, of course, she does become the Christian church. That is, after the birth of Christ, the woman becomes the Christian church. Well, we know this, of course, because she was clothed with the sun and she had the moon under her feet. The sun here could not be the gospel. Why? Well, notice that the gospel came after the birth of Christ. Yet the woman was already clothed with the sun while Christ was in the womb. He was not yet born, but yet the woman was clothed with the sun. So again, we cannot have the cart before the horse. So the sun clothing would have to represent something else not just the gospel. It must go back further. The psalmist in Psalms 119, verse 105 says, thy, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The sun is the word of God, the Bible. That's right, the Bible is symbolized by the sun. The moon naturally reflects the light of the sun, but it too gives light. The two light-giving agencies beaming down God's truth. The difference, then, is that one sends its rays directly and the other indirectly. Thus, the word of God has been conveyed in two different ways. One sun fashion, the other moon fashion. You see, before Moses... The word of God was passed on from father to son by the oral tradition. Indirectly, the moon, in other words, is a symbol of the oral tradition, the time when the word of God was passed down from father to son. Indirectly, that's the moon. But from the time of Moses, the word of God was given directly through writing, just like the sun gives its light directly. In the book, The Great Controversy, page 5, we are told this. During the first 2,500 years of human history, there was no written revelation. Those who had been taught of God communicated their knowledge to others, and it was handed down from father to son through successive generations. The preparation of the written word began in the time of Moses. And thus it is clear that the son must be the Bible, particularly the Old Testament scriptures. 
which was in the possession of the Jewish church at the time of our Savior's birth. It was the scriptures that clothed the church, that clothed the woman. It was shining down upon them. But the period of the moon, the period of the oral tradition, the period without the Bible, was passing away. And that is why it was under her feet. And remember, too, that night comes before day, at least in God's way of viewing things. Remember, in Genesis, God said, when, uh, as he created the earth and man and everything, he says the evening and the morning was the first day and the second day and so forth. The evening and the morning. So the evening preceded the day, the, the light portion. Thus this woman represents God's ever-living church, his people clothed in his truth from the beginning of time to the end. In other words, God's true church is identified as those who possess the truth of God for their day. She is God's ever-living church for all time, his saving truth, his true wife, the truth that gave birth to Christ and that gives birth to all his brethren, all of his true followers. Amen for that. So the woman is clothed with the word of God, the written word. Now, what is the meaning of her crown? A crown, as you know, in the Bible represents authority. A king is crowned, denoting his authority, his rulership. Twelve in the Bible represents God's government. And we know this by looking at Matthew 19, verse 28. Matthew 19, verse 28 says, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Remember that there are twelve months of the year, twelve gates to the holy city, twelve foundations, twelve patriarchs, twelve tribes, twelve apostles, and so on. Twelve is a symbol of God's government. So the twelve stars on the woman, on her crown, would represent her government from the patriarchs right into the New Testament dispensation. From the patriarchs to the New Testament dispensation. We've now identified the woman and what she represents. That is God's ever-living church. God's church that goes all the way back to the very beginning of time. But at the time that John first sees the, sees the woman, she represents the Jewish church about the time of the birth of Christ. But whom does the dragon represent? Well, verse 3 and 4, verses 3 and 4 describe him as having seven heads and ten horns, and his tail drew the third part of heaven. The dragon, as we no doubt are aware, is a symbol of the devil himself, the enemy of God and man. Verse 9 reads, Revelation 12, verse 9 says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. So the dragon is Satan, the arch enemy of God and man. The Bible also says that he had seven heads. What do they represent? Well, heads of the Bible are symbolical of religious bodies or churches or religious movements, in other words. You'll remember that in Revelation 13, the leopard-like beast had seven heads, and one was wounded to death. We know that one of those heads, the wounded one, symbolizes the papacy, which, of course, is a religious body. So if one head is a religious body, then all seven heads must be religious bodies also. Seven shows completeness. Thus the dragon had control over all the churches or religious bodies of that time, the time of the Jewish church, the time when Christ was about to be born, the time of the Roman monarchy. The seven horns would represent governments or civil powers. The seven horns would represent governments, or that is, civil authority, civil powers. You'll remember that in Daniel chapter 8, verses 20 and 21, the kingdoms of Media, Persia, and Grecia were likened to a ram and a goat, respectively. The ram, Media, Persia, had two horns. The goat 
had a notable horn between his eyes, which represents Alexander the Great. Now, we know this. Listen to what the text says in Daniel 8, verses 20 and 21. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia, and the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn which was between his eyes is the first king. In other words, the horns of the dragon, as elsewhere in the Bible, symbolize civil powers, civil governments. The number 10 shows universality or comprehensiveness. It is similar to the usage of the symbol of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. Women symbolizes churches, but it does not mean ten literal churches. Rather, the ten virgins there would represent God's church universally. So ten shows universality or comprehensiveness. Consider, too, that the Bible says in verse 3 that the crowns were on the heads, not the horns. In other words, the religions at the time of Christ's birth possessed the real authority, the real influence. They possessed the power. It is a fact that ancient history shows us that the nations of antiquity were dominated by their religions. Their priests and leaders were, were said to be viewed as gods, a concept that affected nearly every operation of ancient governments. No wonder the scriptures placed the crowns upon the heads and not on the horns. Well, this also reveals that the devil had a substantial control over the Jewish nation. Remember now, the Bible says that he had seven heads, completeness. Now, if this was not true, then they would not have rejected Christ, betrayed the Son of Glory, and then eventually influenced the Romans to scourge and crucify our Lord. So the seven, the number seven, here on the heads, or referring to the heads, would indicate that Satan had control over all of the religions of that day, including the Jewish church as a whole, not every individual, but collectively, generally speaking. Again, that's why our, our Lord was given up and surrendered to the Romans by, by the church at that time. But those who were yearning for the coming of their Savior, who were anxiously accepting the light of the gospel, and who embraced it fully, like, for example, the shepherds, Anna the prophetess, Simeon, and the multitudes who did follow our Lord and Savior. That's right, the humble masses who later gladly received Christ's message of hope and healing. The men who would later on become the great apostles, who left everything for their master. They are represented as the woman travailing in anguish, like a woman about to give birth. They were not under the dragon's control, you see. They were clothed with the sun, the light of God's word. They were unlike the Jewish leaders who sought daily to kill him and halt his work. They, that is, these hungering souls, these souls who accepted the truth gladly, they received the truth and, as a result, salvation. When we put it all together, we have Satan, the dragon, having captured the world, armed with the civil and religious powers, poised to destroy the Messiah as soon as he was born. This is why Satan moved upon Herod to issue a decree to slay all the male children under two years of age. It was Satan who was behind this horrific crime. But we thank God that our Savior was protected. And so as a result, we have the hope of salvation. In fact, Satan not only had the world at large, he had the third part of the stars of heaven, the fallen angels. The book Story of Redemption, pages 17 through 19, tells us that Satan and his sympathizers were expelled from heaven sometime before creation. By the way, note that the Bible said he drew them with his tail, not his claws. That is, the apostate angels were not kidnapped by Satan. He did not pull them out of heaven. Instead, they voluntarily united with him in his rebellion against God's righteous government. They voluntarily decided to unite with Satan. And as a result, 
They were then thrown out. In Testimonies, Volume 3, page 115, the servant of the Lord makes this very clear. She verifies this fact. Well, as a result of their choosing to follow the arch deceiver, they spurned God's love, and as a result, Satan was kicked out of glory, and they with him. And they clung to his tail, if you will. And that's why the Bible says he drew them with his tail, not with his claws. He did not kidnap them, if you will, out of heaven. Well, verse 4 of Revelation 12 is telling us that he cast them down to the earth. Verse 4 of Revelation chapter 12 said that he drew them with his tail, then cast them down to the earth. That is, Satan brought his cohorts and his rebellion against God to the earth. He was determined to hurt Christ by destroying mankind. But when he learned that Jesus would become man, he anxiously awaited the Savior's birth. And armed with the religions, civil powers, and the fallen angels, he tried to overcome our Redeemer, first by attempting to take his life at his birth, then endeavored to cause him to sin. But, praise be to God, he utterly failed, and Jesus was caught up to God and to his throne. He was resurrected a victor over sin and the devil. So in this context, Satan suffered his first big defeat. He missed Christ on earth. He failed to destroy him. Jesus came to this earth to deliver us from the grasp of sin and Satan, that is, from the grasp of the dragon. And he was successful. We have now gotten the foundation of our subject. From here on, the battle between Christ and Satan, between his church and the arch enemy, intensifies. It really gets hot, if you will. The battle intensifies. In verse 6, the woman flees into the wilderness. But what caused her to flee? Verses 7 through 13 of Revelation chapter 12 will give us the answer. So let us turn to Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 13, and we'll read what happens next in our study today. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great red dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Well, here we see that after failing to destroy Christ, Satan was permanently cast down to the earth. In other words, Revelation 12 describes two different castings out. Note that in the first instance, the dragon drew the angels with his tail, but in the second, the Lord cast him down to the earth, and his place was not found in heaven anymore. The incident of verse 4, the dragon drawing the stars, preceded the incident of verse 9, the Lord casting down the dragon. The former took place before Jesus was born, in fact, before creation according to story of redemption. But the latter, the latter casting down, took place after his resurrection. In other words, Satan still had access to heaven prior to the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. Before Christ came, Satan could still go to heaven and visit at times. He used to wait at the gates and accuse God's people of blackness and defilement. That is, Although he was expelled from heaven for his rebellion, he was still allowed to return to heaven on occasions. 
But after the death and resurrection, Satan was strictly forbidden to return to heaven for any reason. He was permanently cast out. This can be proven by looking at the book of Job chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Job chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. There we will find more proof for this very fact, that Satan was still allowed access to heaven prior to the coming of our Lord. Job chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. In Job chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Satan is seen again in heaven, and the Lord asked him the same question, and he answered in the same way. He said that he had come from walking up and down in the earth. Clearly, therefore, Satan had access to heaven prior to the crucifixion of Christ. But let us note that after the crucifixion, he was barred. Speaking about the time of the crucifixion, the book Desire of the Ages, Desire of Ages, page 761, says this about Christ being barred from heaven. Now, remember, this is the crucifixion. Christ now is on the cross, and inspiration is commenting on Satan's position as a result of Christ's crucifixion. Satan saw that his disguise was torn away. His administration was laid open before the unfallen angels and before the heavenly universe. He had revealed himself as a murderer. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings. Henceforth his work was restricted. Whatever attitude he might assume, he could no longer await the angels as they came from the heavenly courts and before him accuse Christ, brethren, of being clothed with the garments of blackness and the defilement of sin. The last link of sympathy between Satan and the heavenly world was broken. On page 834, Christ returns to heaven after the resurrection and is greeted by the Father. The angels and the sinless worlds all gather about him lauding him, giving him praise for his victory over sin, over death and the grave. But then Jesus shows his father the wounded hands, his wounded hands, the pierced brow and feet, then says, at least this is what the father says, the voice of God is heard proclaiming that justice is satisfied, Satan is vanquished. So Christ reveals his hands, his feet, side, and then the voice of God is heard that Satan is vanquished. Now notice this is at the resurrection. The Desire of Ages, page 761, told us that the last link of sympathy between Satan and the heavenly world was broken. His administration was laid open before the unfallen angels. Whatever attitude he might assume, he could no longer await the angels as they came from the heavenly courts and before them accuse Christ's brethren of being clothed with the garments of blackness and the defilement of sin. Satan, in other words, brothers and sisters, was permanently cast down to this earth after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. No wonder that Revelation 12, verses 12 to 13 states, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, ye that dwell in them, and woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Satan was angry. He was fuming. He was furious because he could no longer get Jesus the man-child, our Savior. And now he was cast down to the earth, permanently barred from ever returning back to heaven. So he decided to take his wrath out on Christ's followers, on Christ's bride, the church, the woman. They say that if an enemy wishes to harm a husband but cannot, then he goes after the person closest to his heart his wife. That's what Satan did. The martyrdom of the early centuries of Christianity were the result of Satan's ire, his hatred of Jesus. He sought to obliterate the church, send it to oblivion, in other words. But the Bible says, they love not their lives unto the death. 
Then verses 6 and 14 tell us that the woman fled into the wilderness, and God nourished or fed her there for a time, times, and a dividing of times. That is, 1,260 years. Now there is a common misconception about these verses. It is normally taught that the woman fled into the wilderness for only 1,260 years. But if you look at the text very closely, you will find that the Bible simply states that she was fed or nourished there for that time period. It didn't say specifically how long she would be in the wilderness. Let's take a closer look at the, those verses, verses 6 and 14. Now in verse 6, it says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she have a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. That means they should feed her there in the wilderness. So she first must go into the wilderness, wilderness, and then while there in the wilderness, she was fed for 1,260 years. Verse 14 says, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into her place, into her place. Again, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. In other words, shortly after the crucifixion of our Savior, the church was persecuted and thus forced to leave her homeland and reside in the Gentile world, the wilderness. That's why Acts chapter 8 verse 1 says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Well, this, my friends, is when the church went into the wilderness, when she went into the Gentile world. But things got so bad there that God had to specially nourish the church. By the time of the Dark Ages, the true people of God would well nigh had been annihilated if God had not miraculously preserved the church. The history of people like the Waldenses, the Huguenots, and many other reformers is a testimony to this very fact. God indeed fed his people for 1,260 years. But Satan soon began to change his tactics. Let us look at uh, Revelation 12, verse 15. Verse 15 of our subject today. Verse 15 of Revelation 12 a very important point. Satan changes his strategy. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Well, friends, here you see that the devil realized that his persecuting the church was not working. So what did he do? Well, the Bible says he sent a flood after the woman, he sought to carry her away with false brethren. He sought to paganize her, so to speak. Water in the Bible, as you probably know, represents people, at least in most instances. Uh, Revelation 17:15 talks about uh, the people being likened to many waters. In, Re in Isaiah 17:12, also. So you have Revelation 17:15 and Isaiah 17:12. Now, these people came from the dragon. The water came from the dragon's mouth, so they cannot be good people. They must be the unconverted. The archdeceiver realized that if you can't beat them, you must join them. So he dressed up his pagan or unbelieving puppets and sent them to the church. In other words, after being cast out of heaven and after he had persecuted the church and she had taken her flight into the wilderness, the dragon followed her there. But rather than persecuting her, he cast a worldly-minded flood in an attempt to carry God's faithful people away. Don't you see that after he realized that he could not stop the growth of the Christian church by persecuting her followers, he changed his tactics and compelled the pagans to join her ranks. In other words, he sent a flood, not a stream, not a rivulet, not even a river. The Bible says a flood. 
A flood intends to, to carry you away. Satan felt compelled to do this, you see, because as a result of persecuting the woman, Satan was ironically only helping the divine purpose. You see, as more and more were tortured for their faith, their zeal and love of the truth would become a mighty witness for Jesus Christ. And so the church grew in spirituality. It grew with genuine believers because only the truly faithful dare to take their stand for truth and become members of the hated sect. But when the dragon flooded her with the unconverted, he caused his agents to cease oppressing the Christians and start fellowshipping with them. Thus he beguiled them into thinking him their friend. Being lulled to sleep spiritually, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. And nothing has done the church more harm. Oh, this is quite sobering. This has been Satan's greatest tragedy. If you cannot beat them, join them. In fact, this highly successful course has been unremittingly pursued ever since, until, as a result, the church today is almost choked with tears. It is, as it were, infiltrated with a fifth column. Inspiration put it this way in the book, The Great Controversy, page 385. Uh, listen to the testimony of inspiration in regards here to this particular flood. Now listen very carefully. To secure converts, the exalted standard of the Christian faith was lowered, and as the result, a pagan flood flowing into the church carried with it its customs, practices, and idols. As the Christian religion secured the favor and support of secular rulers, it was nominally accepted by multitudes. But while in appearance Christians, many remained in substance pagans, especially worshiping in secret their idols. Has not the same process been repeated in nearly every church calling itself Protestant? As the founders, those who possessed a true spirit of reform, pass away, their descendants come forward and new model the cause. While blindly clinging to the creed of their fathers and refusing to accept any truth in advance of what they saw, the children of the reformers depart widely from their example of humility, self-denial, and renunciation of the world. Thus the first simplicity disappears. A worldly flood flowing into the church carries with it its customs, practices, and idols. Here we have it. A clear support for verse 15. By failing to maintain the standards of righteousness, by trying to secure the favor of the multitudes, by refusing to accept any truth in advance of what our founders saw, even up to today, God's church is in grave danger of being carried away spiritually, that is, obliterated. That is, spiritually obliterated. The dragon's most successful strategy, brothers and sisters, is working. The SDA church, God's church, our church, the church we love, is in dire straits. It is in serious jeopardy. Now we can see why inspiration says that the church has turned back from following Christ her leader and is steadily retreating toward Egypt. How can we finish the gospel then in this deplorable condition? How can we complete the work that God has given us to do with the flood in our midst? In fact, if something is not done, the flood will carry the church away. The church will not survive. Satan is getting the better of the church, in a matter of speaking, that is. Do you remember the story of Achan? Well, the story is found in the book of Joshua, chapters 6 and 7. The Israelites were instructed that after they conquered Jericho, they were to place all the spoils into the treasury of God. But one man named Achan disobeyed and hid a wedge of gold, silver, and a Babylonian garment. He hid them in his tent. His family knew about it. They all knew about it. And they thought they could hide from God. 
when the Israelites went to the next city to take it, they were repulsed and many of their men were killed. The majority fled in horror. That was a horrendous disgrace to Israel. It was even more humiliating when you consider that it was just a small city called Ai. A small city. Well, after prayer and humiliation, God revealed the culprit. It was Achan. They stoned Achan and his family, and that did stay the curse, the curse of God upon Israel. The servant of the Lord made this comment about this event in Israelite history. The statement is found in Volume 5, Testimonies for the Church, page 157, and listen very keenly to this very startling statement. If the presence of one Achan was sufficient to weaken the whole camp of Israel, can we be surprised at the little success which attends our efforts when every church and almost every family has its Achan? A serious question indeed. How can we in our present condition as a church finish the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit unless purification takes place in our ranks? But you may ask, well, won't the shaking purify the church? Won't the false brethren be shaken out? Well, unfortunately, we don't have the time to discuss the shaking right now. However, suffice it to say that there are two shakings, one caused by false doctrine, where some will renounce their faith in the fundamental truths that God has given us, and that's in Testimonies to Ministers, page 112. We know that some will, will, will fly out of the church, if you will. In fact, many, we're told, will, will leave the faith. And the most important shaking, the most important shaking, is caused not by false doctrine but by the straight testimony that's in early writings page 270 we mentioned that earlier but neither of these shakings will ultimately purge God's church oh no something else will climax the shaking something else will do this job what is it well let us turn to Revelation 12 let's go back there Revelation chapter 12 verse 6 verse 16 Revelation chapter 12 verse 16 Listen to what it says. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. What happened to the flood? According to the Bible, it was swallowed up. In other words, God removed the unconverted. He removed the flood. Yes, the time is coming when the unfaithful, the unrepentant, the tares will no longer exist among the people of God. Yes, God is going to remove the worldlings from among his last day church. From among his last day people. Soon Seventh day Adventists will have to go through a literal purifying process, thereby thwarting the dragon's almost successful attempt to destroy God's people. Yes, this event is physical. It is a literal event. Now, how do we know that? Well, our answer is found in the book of Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9. There it describes what is about to take place within the house of God. Now, we're not able to study that chapter now, but an in-depth exposition of Ezekiel 9 can be found, of course, by reading it and looking at the testimonies. But... In our tape, the 144,000, who are they? It will provide you with those references and an explanation based on the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Revelation chapter 7, the topic is the 144,000, who are they? There you can find information about the 144,000. But by way of summary, we can say this. Ezekiel 9 describes a physical judgment to take place in the SDA church at the culmination of the shaking. In the book Manuscript Releases, Volume 1, page 260, inspiration tells us that Ezekiel 9 is literal. That's Manuscript Releases, Volume 1, page 260. The statement says, Study the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. These words will be literally fulfilled. 
study the ninth chapter of Ezekiel, these words will be literally fulfilled. In Testimonies, Volume 5, page 211, we are told that the SDA Church is the first to feel the judgment of God. On page 505 of the same book, Volume 5, Testimonies for the Church, page 505 says that Ezekiel 9 is likened to the Passover in Egypt. That's Volume 5, page 505. In Testimonies, Volume 1, page 190 and 198 of the Testimonies for the Church, this is what the servant of the Lord has to say about the purifying process that is soon to take place in our church, also described in Ezekiel 9. And I saw that the Lord was wetting his sword in heaven to cut them down. Oh, that every lukewarm professor could realize the clean work that God is about to make among his professed people. Angels keep a faithful record of every man's work. And as judgment passes upon the house of God, the sentence of each is recorded by his name. And the angels commissioned to spare not the unfaithful servants, but to cut them down at the time of slaughter. Isaiah 52 verse 1 confirms this very fact, the fact that we've been talking about, and that is the purification of God's church, that God will have a purified church prior to the last great proclamation of the gospel. Isaiah 52 verse 1 says, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Well, this cleansing, as you can see, is definitely a purification. Here the prophet in Isaiah says that the wicked shall no more come in or among God's people. That's right. Nothing that is uncircumcised or unclean, that is, was talking of spiritually, shall ever come in God's church again. Now, we have not yet reached that point because, obviously, the church is now flooded with the tares, with the unconverted, the uncircumcised, and the unclean. But the time is coming when the church will be purified, will be cleansed. Well, brothers and sisters, one more time, this cleansing, this purification, the removal of the flood does not take place during the seven last plagues. It is prior to the last great proclamation of the gospel. It is, in other words, before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, this cleansing takes place prior to all of these latter-day events. In other words, before the church can face the great onslaught of the enemy about to take place in the future. That is the, the, the mark of the beast before we could face the plagues, before the second coming, all of these things. The church must be purified. In the book Prophets and Kings, page 725, we've mentioned this reference a couple of times already, but one more time, let us listen to what inspiration has to say. It's taken from Prophets and Kings, page 725. Clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness, the church is to enter upon her final conflict, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and as terrible as an army with banners. She is to go forth into all the world to conquering and to conquer. Yes, the gospel will be preached by a purified church, conquering and to conquer. This could not be the second coming or the plagues, for the church would have already completed the proclamation of the gospel. That is, by the time Christ comes, by the time the, the plagues begin to, to fall, in other words, the plagues, then you have the second coming. Before all of that can happen, the church would have already been purified. The gospel would have already been proclaimed. Isaiah 66. In Isaiah chapter 66, verses 15... 16 and 19, we find there the same thought, the same thought. If you have your Bibles, please turn to it. Isaiah chapter 66, verses 15, 16 and 19. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Verse 19, 
and I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape of them unto the nations, to Tarshish, and then to Pul and Lud, that row the bow to Tubal, to Javan, to the owls afar off, that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Did you get the lesson, brothers and sisters? Here the Bible describes a coming of the Lord. Now this is not the second coming of Christ in the clouds of glory. This is a coming of judgment. Now notice that after this particular coming, that the saints escape, and they do not go to heaven, at least not at this point. The Bible says in verse 19 that I will set a sign among them and will send those that escape. Escape what? Well, the only thing here to escape from would be the judgment in verses 15 and 16. Now, those who escape do not go to heaven, at least not immediately. They go out and preach the gospel to those who have never heard of the, the truth. In other words, all over the world. They go and declare his glory among the nations. So this could not be the second coming. So the Bible here is describing a judgment that must take place first, and then after which those who are in the church who are filled with the Spirit will go out and proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. This proves that this, again, is not the second coming, and that there must first be a purifying process in the church, after which those who remain go out and finish the work. As we've seen, that this judgment is literal. This purifying process is the climax of the shaking which prepares the church to go out now filled with the spirit clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness going forth conquering and to conquer in numbers 16 the book numbers 16 verses 32 and 33 we have an example or a type of what will happen to the unconverted there were three men named Korah, Dathan and Abiram they along with numerous other rebels were destroyed at the Lord's hand the setting is the Israelite wandering in the wilderness. And you can read that in uh, verses 32 and 33 where it says that these men were swallowed up into the earth. They were swallowed up into the earth. Very similar to Revelation chapter 12, verse 16. But, brothers and sisters, there is good news. There is good news. Verse 17 of Revelation 12 says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Did you get the lesson here, brother or sister? Did you get the point? Note that after the flood is removed, Satan is wroth. He's angry with the woman, but he does not war with her. He instead wars with the remnant of her seed, her children. Let's read it again. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You see, after the purification of God's church, the dragon cannot touch the woman, that is the 144,000. Why? Because they are already sealed. They are the ones left alive after the purification of God's church. But he fights with those who are still yet in the world, who are still outside, still in Babylon. You know that an enemy, if he cannot get the husband, he goes after the wife, and he cannot get the wife, he goes after the children. That is, in this context, the remnant of her seed, then, would be the great multitude, those who are still yet in Babylon, who have not yet had a chance to embrace the gospel fully. Some may be in other churches. Some may have never heard of the gospel, but they will get their chance, and then they will take a stand for God's true Sabbath. That is, when the winds begin to blow. That is, when the mark of the beast decree is roaming and running throughout the earth. And at the penalty of death, these great people will take a stand. They will heed the message of the 144,000 and take a stand for the truth. But you may ask, does not the SDA church now keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus? Of course we do, absolutely. We, we profess to keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. But so will the great multitude. However, the real context of Revelation 12, 17 is speaking about the church after it's purified. So it's not speaking about now so much. It is speaking about the church after it is purified. 
That is after God removes the flood, after God removes the unconverted. Then it is that the woman, the purified church, will truly keep God's laws and will be sealed and protected against the dragon. That is why he is only angry with the woman, the 144,000, but he goes to war or persecute those who are still in Babylon by bringing about the mark of the beast or the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. In early writings, page 33, Sister White says, I saw that God had children who do not see and keep the Sabbath. They have not rejected the light upon it. And at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. So Satan would have met his third defeat after the flood is swallowed up. The first defeat was when Satan missed Christ. His second was when he was permanently cast down to the earth. The third defeat will be when the flood is swallowed up. Oh, brothers and sisters, are you ready? Will you be one of those who will survive the judgment soon to come upon the house of God so that the gospel work can be finished in all the world? Will you be one of those who will go out filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and gather in his faithful from the world? Now is the time to draw nigh to the Master. Now is the time. Now is the time to come close, very near to our Savior. He loves us, but the whole controversy is at stake. The church is at stake, and the world is at stake. Soon he will take matters into his own hands. He has promised to stand up and deliver everyone who will stand for him. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. From henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. God bless you.